Thompson, <coughs> right, and resident at Tuckahoe Plantation. Um, and since I was the recipient of your generosity there, hostessing, why don't you tell us about sharing your home and your location on the river? Why don't we kind of do it backwards and start with what you're doing now to bring okay. people to your place? All right. Well, at the end of my uh, Actually, it started in 1967. My mother found out that we were the location for Virginia State Route 288, which would complete the beltway around Richmond. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, that started a long legal uh, episode. Uh, I went on to law school and um, by the time I was, uh, I guess, second year law, first year law school, it was in the federal district court. And um, my mother had been approached about gifting an easement, <clears throat> but it was sort of a, a quid pro quo. If you all will give an easement over the property, then we'll say that the highway will have a, an adverse impact. And uh, she thought that was not the right way to do it. <laughs> Either it was an adverse impact or it wasn't an adverse impact. And uh, so they said, well, we'll proceed. So we, uh, my grandmother was alive at the time. And uh, so they took, uh, Actually, it was very fortuitous. My mother, um, when she was a student at Wellesley, was a very good friend of Lloyd Cutler's wife. He was a, a super lawyer. And uh, they were getting ready for their, I think it was their 40th Wellesley reunion. So my mother traveled to Washington to have lunch with her friend. And uh, Lloyd Cutler just happened to join them at lunch. <clears throat> and. She, they asked her how things were, and she said, they, well, they're just terrible. They're about to condemn 60 acres of Tuckahoe. And uh, uh, she was just very upset. <clears throat> and uh, Lloyd said, well, Jesse, uh, you don't have to let them do it. And she said, what do you mean? And he told her about the, uh, all the wonderful environmental legislation that had passed in the late 60s that Richard Nixon had signed including the uh, Historic Preservation Act, the 1968 Act, uh, amendments to the Highway Act, and then finally uh, the uh, uh, NEPA in 1970. <clears throat> so she hired uh, Wilmer Cutler and Pickering and Hunt and Williams Associated on the case. And uh, Judge Marriage uh, ruled mostly in our favor but uh, was going to allow the state to condemn the land under a provision that would require them to reconvey it if they didn't build a highway within 13 years. And she said, that's not good enough. <clears throat> um, and against the advice of the lawyers, insisted on appealing to the Fourth Circuit where Judge Butzner agreed with her that uh, title to land is, is a significant thing, going way back to uh, the Middle Ages, of course, and the English common law. And so we had a complete victory in court. <clears throat> and uh, they concluded that the uh, environmental impact study, and this was an early one, so you can kind of understand that how they didn't get it right, uh, <clears throat> that they would have to start over again with a new environmental impact study. And then the gas crisis of 1973 hit. So they really didn't do anything for about five years. And then they started back up. <clears throat> in uh, the late 70s, and by that time, uh, my wife Sue and I had moved to Tuckahoe. And with mother and father had concluded that uh, Tuckahoe was a historic plantation and sort of an island of the 18th century between two subdivisions. And that was why they didn't want to say that it was going to be an adverse impact because they said, well, you're how do we know you're not going to 
put in a subdivision, and that would be worse than a highway. <clears throat> well, anyway, we decided it would be better to share Tuckahoe as what it is, uh, uh, an historic site, an early Randolph home and boyhood home of Thomas Jefferson. And so we formed a little corporation <clears throat> in May of 1979 to uh, start our tourism business. <clears throat> and uh, certainly one of the motives was uh, so we could share it with the public and demonstrate what I just said, that that's a better way for the public to enjoy the place rather than people zooming by in their automobiles at 70 miles an hour. So that's one reason why I was so nice to you. That was part of the ethic uh, that uh, we've had. And um, <clears throat> finally they did uh, you know, get the environmental impact study going again and they developed some other routes and we have the route that we have today. Uh, <laughs> no, they were. <clears throat> well, the initial route would have had it cut a across the front fields in view of the house. Our um, uh, Goodson County supervisor said, "Well, it, the least you can do is align it down the property line." So it was going to go down our eastern property line and mostly been out of sight from the main house, but it would have been only a thousand feet to the east. And certainly the noise would have been significant as it crossed the floodplain of the James River, uh, elevated at, at 30 plus feet to accommodate the floods that can happen out our way. And I've worked for the Federal Highway Department for three years. You cannot hurt my feelings. Okay. <laughs> was no one, none of the planners, none of the people you talked to in the Federal Highway Department sensitive to the history? <clears throat> not only were the, the feds not, and this is a federal aid highway, right. because uh, the, inter the interstate, uh, the 295 portion, only goes uh, for the, the backward C, if you will. And when they were laying out the interstate system in the, I guess, early to late 50s, they decided there wouldn't be enough traffic in the Chesterfield Southwest Quadrant to justify that as an interstate highway. And the state said, no, we want to build it <coughs> uh, to have a beltway. And it'll be, a, they agreed it would be a federal aid highway, which would get 50% federal funding. And of course, the state wasn't any good either. So I, I, the feds, um, you know, relied on the state highway department. Of course, they were going to build the, the road. And what the state tried to do, and rather than being on our side, they tried to gerrymander the funds and say, well, the eight-mile Tucko segment <coughs> will build with 100% state funds, so we don't have to comply with the federal, uh, you know, Highway Act amendments and NEPA and all that. So we don't have to do an environmental impact statement because there's no requirement to at the state level, at least at that time. And that was one of the big issues in uh, the district court. <clears throat> so even though uh, I live in Thomas Jefferson's boyhood home, I think I identify more <clears throat> with uh, Alexander Hamilton and John Marshall uh, as uh, you might say, a Latter-day Federalist, because if it hadn't been for the, the federal legislation and the federal court system and the federal courts interpreting the legislation and the legislative intent in the spirit and letter of the law, we would have uh, had that highway. Perhaps the state would have been allowed to gerrymander those funds. and. Uh, the second environmental impact study would not have had to be done, and the original location would have prevailed. Of course, there was a matter of a really fine lawyer in there also. Right, but he had some really fine law to work with, <laughs> and, law. and the federal court system. So a, a few of the things you know that Thomas Jefferson envisioned, like uh, a country full of yeoman farmers, didn't happen. <clears throat> 
and certainly our experience demonstrated that his belief that the best government was the most local and closest government to you, that wasn't the case. And uh, his uh, belief in states' rights, uh, that was the antithesis of, of what helped us. So I'm very pleased nowadays to serve on the board of the John Marshall Foundation. <laughs> and uh, it's funny because uh, there are a couple of connections that John Marshall had with Tucker. Of course, he was a, a Randolph and was Thomas Jefferson's second or third cousin. <clears throat> his, his grandmother grew up at Tuckahoe, <clears throat> and she was quite a, quite a, uh, a liberated woman, you might say. Um, and also, uh, when the uh, so-called bizarre scandal occurred involving Jefferson's Randolph cousins there at Tuckahoe, uh, it was one of two cases that John Marshall and Patrick Henry uh, collaborated on. And they, of course, were opposite ends of the political spectrum. Uh, but they nevertheless collaborated on the, the Cumberland County inquest that involved the, the Randolphs of Tuckahoe and also one of the uh, post-revolutionary war uh, English debt cases. Um, before we dig into that, <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to I want to be clear. When what were the years that the state, working with the Federal Highway Administration, wanted to put 288 through your property? When did that begin? <clears throat> it began in the fall of 1967. 67. I was in college, and a neighbor called my mother up and said, "Are you?" going up to the hearing at, in Goodson Courthouse. And she said, what hearing? She said, oh, the one that is going to talk about the highway going through, through your land. And uh, that was the start of it. And, and I'm I have to say I'm really confused because I've worked with these laws a lot over my mm -hmm. career. The state, I assume, were, were the ones that were actually talking to you all about at this point. They were going to call... They had filed their certificate of take in May of 1970. And, they were, and how... Explain to me again how it works that they were going to call Tuckahoe Plantation an adverse impact on the forest. <coughs> they... Um, <coughs> The new environmental laws required that they do, since federal funding was involved, mm -hmm. and Tuckahoe had been named a National Historic Landmark in 1969, I guess it was, <laughs> under the 1960s. Well, that's actually under the 1935 Historic Preservation mm -hmm. Act and gives us the same benefit that the Hoke Brady Road portion of the National Battlefield Park uh, mm -hmm. enjoyed, if you will, or, uh, and that is Section 4F that says that these projects cannot be uh, built if there's an adverse impact um, unless there is no uh, prudent and feas feasible alternative. So maybe I misunderstood the first time you said that. So it sounds like they, they would have been saying because we'll have, because 288, <coughs> Interstate mm -hmm. 288, will have an adverse impact on Tuckahoe, we will find another route. Well, that what, what they concluded, <coughs> since my mother wasn't, and grandmother weren't willing to donate an easement in 1968-69 when they were approached by the, the, then it was the Virginia Landmarks Commission, which is now the Department of Historic Resources which, by the way, I had the pleasure of serving on and also as the chairman of that board um, a few years back. Uh, and we've, of course, since then granted easements, the first one in 1986, in large part thanks to uh, my friend Fred Fisher, because they'd already been down that route. <laughs> and then we added additional acreage uh, with subsequent Easements in the in the in 2004 and 2006. 
but, but I would think if, if the highway... But here's, here's what happened. Okay. When mother and grandmother said, no, we're not going to give an easement, they said, well, there's a risk, and we think it's a greater risk than a highway that you all could turn it into a subdivision, and so we're not going to say that the highway would have an adverse impact on the property. Oh, now that's a stretch. From my mother's point of view and her opinion was that the way the, hist the Virginia Landmarks Commission went about the easement donation was extortion. We're not going to say it's bad for this historic property unless you give us the easement because we think a subdivision would be worse. And, you know, philosophically, I can agree with them, but that's not the way to go about it. And uh, it all turned out all right in the end, but only because we took them to court and only because of the, the federal legislation. And a good lawyer. And a good lawyer. And um, I, uh, w w so there was kind of a dead spell in all of the proceedings from 1973, as I said, because of the gas crisis until 1978 or so, and things started back up again. And, uh, and that was also an incentive uh, for us to open to the public. My wife and I moved in in 77. Things are starting up again in 78 with the, the new environmental impact study. And so we uh, f formed our little corporation and started uh, f being formally uh, open to the public in uh, May of 1979. And I think it was later that summer <laughs> Uh, I was jubilant for a couple of weeks because I thought we had won. Um, Jimmy Carter was president. I voted for Gerald Ford because I was a good Republican and uh, in those days. And his uh, Secretary of Transportation, Neil Goldschmidt, said, you know what? Beltways are not good for cities. So we're not going to support beltways anymore. And there were articles in the in the paper um, ab about that, and I had formed uh, with uh, Pat McSweeney's help a uh, thing called the Coalition Against Senseless Highways, C A S H, and uh, uh, I was interviewed by uh, Mr. Friedel and had a an op-ed piece he wrote about it, and I wrote a, a piece in the paper about not buckling the beltway. So anyway, when Goldschmidt came out with his policy statement, we thought we had won. <laughs> and uh, within two weeks, he was fired. <laughs> <laughs> and the, this light bulb kind of came on. I said, you know what? <clears throat> the, the two issues that really mean the most to me are <clears throat> um, the environment, obviously influenced by my uh, struggle in, in this highway uh, and our family struggle with this highway. And totally unrelated, but what I see is a, a, a issue of conscience. Um, and that's because I'd gone to law school and the, and the Roe v. Wade decision came out while I was uh, in law school. And uh, to me, a, you know, a woman's right to choose uh, I saw. So since then, I voted on those two issues. <laughs> and um, I, I haven't voted for a... Uh, Jerry Ford was the last Republican I voted for. <laughs> Subsequently, um, the environmental impact statement was, was redone. They said it was an adverse impact. Um, the highway was moved to where it is today, so we're, we're the reason that, uh, there, that you have to go two miles out of your way on 64 before you can continue south on 288. And there is a lot of traffic on it because there are a lot of folks that commute back and forth between uh, Western Chesterfield and Western Henrico. Um, in 1986, we did place our first easement on uh, portions of the property, including all of the historic area. And the easement even includes not only um, the, 
exterior of all of the historic buildings, but also even the interior uh, uh, woodwork and other features of uh, the main house. Which are spectacular. Um, and thank you for your work. Um, <laughs> because that, <clears throat> anytime a case that egregious is successfully won, I don't have to tell you as a lawyer, but I'm going to say it for the tape. Anytime <laughs> a case that important and groundbreaking happens, it's opening the door for other people right. who perhaps didn't have quite well, the, so much history on their side. The opening cases were actually the Vier Carre case in um, New Orleans and the Overland Park case, which was spearheaded by a, a very determined uh, non-lawyer woman. And so... What's her name? I don't recall. I grew up next door to Overland Park and I don't know what you're talking about. Well, those were the two cases that had gone before us. So you've done extraordinary successes, work impact, on historic preservation of the properties. Have you had similar work with the river? And how does your hospitality with the mm -hmm. historic structures, how does that relate to the river in addition to the generosity of that wonderful bench that we were sitting on that day? I appreciate the river, <laughs> but how, tell me about your relationship to the river and well, your relationship and the house to the river. Well, I grew up in uh, the west end of Richmond, about 10 miles east of Tuckahoe, <clears throat> in the city limits. And uh, as a, I guess, young teenager, we, we would, um, there was a path that went down to the canal, and there were some locks and uh, s some white water and um, and so I'd go down there for, for hikes and uh, to, to mess around. And, uh, and then I remember one spring uh, in high school, we, we all went, uh, if you made good grades, you got a day off. And some friends and I went down to the uh, just east of the falls of, of the James, <clears throat> in the, actually in the city limits. And, uh, uh, there was some low water, and we were we were just picking up shad out of potholes in the rocks. <laughs> I'm not much of a fisherman; I'm more of a sailor. So that that kind of fishing was kind of fun. You didn't need a pole or sinkers, hooks or bait. <laughs> it was it was great. Remind me what what is the mansion, the big house? When was the big house built? Um, we think it was completed pretty much as you see it <clears throat> by uh, 1740. So we think it was complete um, when uh, Jefferson arrived in 1745 or so. I was trying to piece this together, but I know you can tell me. You're obviously above the fall line. Right. So you're quite different from the plantations that were built below the fall line. Right. Their, their title, although in some respects, uh, what, we're in the backup behind the uh, Boschers Dam, so we actually have motor boats uh, in the summer, and ski boats, and, and uh, over in Chesterfield there's a boat club. So there's quite a bit of boating in. It's about an eight-mile stretch. We're about maybe a little bit over halfway to the west of how far it goes up, uh, a little bit further past us. So. At this point, which I didn't realize, I guess I didn't sit there long enough, it's mm -hmm. a major recreation spot of the river. Right. You're and in the middle of a major recreation yeah. spot of the river. And we have an unimproved boat landing. And I um, remember when my wife and I were uh, newly there, we, we uh, did an uh, evening canoe trip with some good friends and uh, put in up uh, <clears throat> near Sabbath uh, Island. And, and canoed for a couple hours down to Tuckahoe, and that was fun. I remember in the the uh, I guess the first time that I really thought about the impacts of the river on on Tuckahoe was when we had the big flood. Um, I guess that was Camille, and it uh, 
it completely flooded our, our low grounds. Of course, we're, the, the Kanawha Canal goes by right at the bottom of the hill and just <clears throat> to the south of that on what was the towpath of the canal is the uh, CNO, now CSX, uh, railway. And uh, I have to chuckle remembering one time when a, a tourist said, well, well, why did they, you know, and, and it's a, just, a, it's probably not but what, 30 yards to the, uh, the steep drop down to the canal and the railroad tracks and somebody came out of the house and looked down the hill and said, well, why did they build a house so close to the railroad tracks? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, it's a question of timing. The house was built before the railroad tracks. Even the canal didn't get up to Tuck until about 1814. And then it continued all the way west through the Blue Ridge to Buchanan, Virginia. So you just answered half my question. The canal mm -hmm. got to you to Tuckahoe in eighteen fourteen. Right. So when it was first built and transportation was largely on the river, well not by horse, but what, what where was I assume it was farmed and where did how was the river used since you didn't have access to well, the Richmond, did you? Well, I guess you could have gone to Richmond. Yeah. Uh, what um, was the relationship to <clears throat> um, well, it made for the fertile low grounds. The floods brought in mm -hmm. um, nutrients. Um, today it also brings a lot of Johnson grass seed. Um, and we haven't had a, a big flood for a, a few years now, but uh, that big flood in 1969-70 um, swept away our cattle herd and um, my brother was living there at the time, and he could tell you some interesting stories about our old caretaker and how they got in the, uh, I guess, a John boat with a little outboard motor and were trying to get <clears throat> the cows to swim back across. Because what happens is the, the um, when the river, well, we're lucky where we are because we're right there at the, uh, the the terminus, you might say, of, uh, of Tuckahoe Creek. It comes off the high ground, and then I think it was probably uh, into a, a slave dug ditch because it sort of makes a T. And one branch goes east and one branch goes west to us. And so we, uh, we own the westernmost piece of Henrico County. And the rest of it's in Goochland, north of Tuckahoe Creek. But south of Tuckahoe Creek is Randolph Island. But what's interesting, the topography, it's uh, when the river, well, first of all, when the river gets up, <laughs> Tuckahoe Creek, which usually flows from east to west across our property, with, when, except in a drought when it's dry, <clears throat> uh, or just stack, you know, water sitting there, Anytime it rains, it'll get enough water to flow west, but when the river comes up, it reverses and flows east. So it funnels off a lot of, uh, a lot of the flood water, so we don't uh, have the river come out of its banks where we are until it gets to about a, maybe a, a two-foot flood stage. And then it will come out along the railroad track first and work its way back up toward the river. So it comes out sort of right at the north end of the low grounds and then works its way south <clears throat> back to the uh, river banks. And finally, uh, and then actually the highest um, part of the low grounds is in Henrico County. Randolph Island is south of the Tuckahoe Creek. And so what happened is as the waters came up, the cows uh, ended up migrating to Randolph Island and went up to the, the highest peak of the ground up in the middle of the island. And uh, finally, they were washed away. <clears throat> and, <laughs> and some of them at least survived and ended up on the uh, uh, Country Club of Virginia uh, golf course. And uh, I 
Um, I, th I guess they can. Sorry. Yeah, but not real well. Not real well. They wouldn't do so great in a current. So uh, my brother and Mr. Pillow went out to try to get the cows to come back, but to no avail. So uh, the next, you know, later that summer and the next summer they were s serving uh, Tuckahoe tenderloin tips. <laughs> and I remember uh, some of my law school classmates uh, after our first year there, um, one of them was at one of the big Richmond law firms and uh, was in the, the country club, I guess, uh, had the firm on retainer and was wondering if there was any liability on the part of the Tucko owners for the damage the cows had done on their uh, golf courses. <laughs> and uh, the conclusion was that a flood is an act of God, so there was no liability. But, uh, and we did try to, I think, I think my brother went down there with a the game warden. They tried to dart some of them and tranquilize them and, and get them uh, back to Tuckahoe, but they didn't seem to have the right formula because the cows didn't seem to cooperate at all. <laughs> well, as I recall, you're on a considerable bluff over the water. That's how, right. How high did the water get that it would wash away the cows? <clears throat> well, it, um, we have about, um, what is it, 100 acres or more, a couple hundred acres on the low, okay. low grounds. And that's where the cows were. Normally, uh, when Mr. Pilla heard there'd be a flood, he would bring them up onto the, the 100 acres of high ground pasture instead of the 100 acres of low ground pasture. But this thing happened over a weekend. It was a hurricane, and it just dumped tremendous amounts of rain, as you know, in the western parts of the state. And there were big floods out there, too. And, and so by the time he realized what was happening on Monday, <clears throat> the cows were already moving out toward the island and away from coming up the hill. How many cattle did you lose? Though? I guess it was about, maybe about 40. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm still kind of back on before the canal was built and the house was there for many, many years before then. Right. And transportation, the easiest transportation was by boat, right? Well, it wasn't so easy. <laughs> you had uh, the bateaus, yeah. <clears throat> and um, it was kind of hazardous. You know, depending on water levels, it could be too low, and you're scraping along the, you know, the riffle bars, or all of a sudden you could have a flood and it, or high water, and it could be extremely dangerous. Um, when the uh, uh, Joe Ayers, you might know, uh, um, started, well, they found the, bat the, the bateaus in the turning basin when they built the um, James Center. And so he was, I think, one of the first ones to build a replica of that bateau and took a trip <clears throat> down the James River and they stopped at Tuckahoe and we had a little, little festival and uh, and then I actually boarded the bateau and went with them d down through the, uh, the James, uh, through town to Maymont. And that was really interesting. Uh, um, so these days are actually from the time, remind me when you moved. <coughs> we moved in in April of 1977. 1977. So you've got <coughs> between, <coughs> excuse me, the house, between your home and the James, you have the canal, the towpath, and the railroad. Uh, uh, well, the, it's the, yeah, the canal, the towpath is the railroad track now. So it's a big embankment, and no flood has ever come over the railroad track. But what does that mean for your access to the river? Do you, can you get down to a well, We have a grade crossing <clears throat> that the um, railroad maintains. And is that pedestrian only, or can you go? <clears throat> no, it's good for vehicles and farm equipment. And it's in good repair right now, but sometimes it, it hasn't been. And the railroad maintains that? Right, and they own, they own the right-of-way through the property. And what does that mean for you 
these days to enjoy the dreams? Do you keep them both there? Do you um, a limitation on your access? What does that mean for you in the recreation? The you just have to look both ways at the railroad crossing for make sure you don't have a train coming. And um, <clears throat> our access to the river uh, could be better, we, um, but the, the river keeps eroding the, the unimproved ramp that we had, so we don't have great access right at the moment because the ramp is in bad repair. But you can go, we'd go down there and go swimming when uh, a few years back when I was um, ba bailing square bales for the, the horses, which I've pretty much given up over the last decade. That was a nice thing to do, go down and jump in the river and cool off. And there's a little bit of current, um, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. You can out, out swim it, thanks to the Bosher's Dam. And it's probably about maybe 15 or 20 feet deep. <coughs> Um, along our, our property. When, um, I wonder when the, it's probably not an issue when the canal was put in, but when, when, when the railroad was put in, I wonder if mm -hmm. folks like you who lived along the river said, but you're ruining our access to the river. I think they looked at it as an, an improvement, <clears throat> and I, I, I haven't looked at the chain of title with an eye to see what happened, but they probably just donated it. It's just a narrow strip, and they were going to get the benefit of the, the railroad. And up until maybe 1954 or 55, Tuckahoe was a flag stop. So maybe that, oh. so um, in my grandfather's day when they were, when my grandmother and grandfather were living there, <clears throat> in theory at least, you could go down there and wave a flag and the train would stop and you could get on and ride down to Main Street Station. <laughs> but they weren't coal cars then, were they? What kind well, of they had a lot of coal cars then. And I, I don't know when, uh, I don't, I, I'm, in my memory, there was no passenger service. Um, I do recall the story of uh, when the Coolidge's uh, acquired the property um, in um, at the end of the 19th century, and they were direct descendants of Thomas Jefferson and the, and the Randolph Builders of Tuckahoe. <clears throat> they had a big uh, reunion party in uh, this, you know, I think it was April of like 1904 or something like that, and they had a special party train come out from town <clears throat> and stop at the Tuckahoe Crossing, and they all walked up the hill for the big party. And, you know, there was great great grandfather that, you know people there that could remember great great grandfather talking about building the house. Did you ever, um, in your time at, at the plantation, did you ever fish in the James? Um, I'm not much of a fisherman, but we've had some of our um, employees and tenants uh, do some fishing, and supposedly right there at the mouth of. Um, uh, Tucko Creek, which is the boundary between Goochland and Henrico on the north side of the river, our property, uh, that's supposed to be a great uh, bass uh, fishing hole. Still today? I, I think so. And my father used to, uh, when, after he took up duck hunting, um, he used to uh, try to attract ducks uh, in the mouth of the creek there. <clears throat> probably illegally with a handful of corn. Uh, but they wise up pretty quickly. Of course, we don't do that anymore. There's also uh, some, um, <clears throat> in wet periods, there are, uh, it's like a swamp uh, right up against the, uh, the, the river bank. Again, because I guess the river bank tends to be higher, so it, it'll back up a shallow uh, swamp and wood ducks like it in there. So it's wooded, a wooded buffer, if you will, against the river where there's a swamp and, and the wood ducks like that. Um, so, yeah. So we were talking about floods, and I remember uh, in the early 70s, there were, it seemed like there were, was one almost every other, or every summer. And it was fun to um, 
you, f you felt like you were on the Mississippi River instead of the James River because instead of it being, what, an extra maybe almost quarter of a mile to the, the calm river and its banks and only maybe, what, 200 yards wide, <coughs> it's stretching maybe over half a mile wide and r current raging along so you could hear it. And uh, it was fun to walk on the railroad track along the, the river, which of course was all on the south side because it, and the canal side on your, on the north side, but uh, you really felt like you were somewhere else, not the James River. Um, <coughs> uh, one major flood I recall was, uh, I think it was in 1986, the fall, fall of 1986. It was uh, actually in November, not a hurricane, <clears throat> but a very uh, wet spell. And uh, I had, was in the middle of harvesting corn that I'd planted on Randolph Island. And we actually had a, <coughs> uh, a, a bridge that could support 15 or 20 tons that actually was uh, left over from the 1969 flood. It had been part of the Cartersville Bridge. And I don't know how Mr. Pillow and my brother got it uh, brought down to Tucko and set on concrete uh, bulkheads across the Tucko Creek, but it made farming possible over on Randolph Island again. And uh, anyway, um, the same thing kind of happened. It all happened over a weekend. <clears throat> and by the time uh, Monday came around, my combine, combine was sitting over there on Randolph Island and water was already uh, starting to come over the bridge. So there was no way I was gonna drive this combine across the bridge, even though it wasn't a whole lot of water on it. And so it just had to sit out there in the flood. And, um, and I'm a, a, I'm a, pilot and back then I was doing some uh, charter flying and picked up this guy at Dulles and brought him back to Richmond and I detoured enough to swing over Randolph Island, look down on the combine to see that it was still there <laughs> because it, there are a couple of tree lines uh, in the way that you can't, so you couldn't see from the, the house or anywhere to see if it was still there or whether it had been swept away, uh, but it survived. Um, Another thing that I, I would uh, say was one of my accomplishments at Tucka when when we moved in, <clears throat> the uh, the trees had grown up not only on the front bank and along the railroad track, but also uh, in the low grounds in the direct line of sight to the river, and uh, so you you really didn't know we were a, a river plantation because you couldn't see the river at all. And um, I had seen some old photographs, and even in the early 50s when I first went out there, you, you, in, the, you know, in the winter you could sort of see it uh, between some of the trees when the leaves were off. <clears throat> and so uh, one year I, 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 I took the, uh, some of the, we, we would get uh, funding for not planting the, uh, the low grounds and putting it in the agricultural reserve. And uh, so I took the money that we were granted from the U.S. Department of Agriculture <clears throat> and we first we harvested timber and then we used the uh, Department of Agriculture money to uh, grub up the stumps, basically hired a bulldozer <clears throat> and reopened the vista to the river. So another reason why um, I'm a big fan of the federal government, I guess, is they reopened our connection to the river. What year was that? That was uh, um, the early 80s, I think. My parents were in, in Europe, so I didn't uh, have them to ask permission. I just did it. <laughs> I think they were aghast at first, but then they realized that it was a a wonderful thing to have Tucko reconnected to the river. So today, <clears throat> what, what is your primary connection with the river? 
it, uh, mostly it's uh, well. There's, we do some hunting uh, for, and that's recreation. We don't swim down there as much as we used to, but we certainly go for walks uh, on the low grounds and to the to the river. Um, and of course, it's a, a wonderful vista looking across the the floodplain low grounds uh, to our view of the river. But we have to keep chopping on some trees to keep it open because uh, they keep getting bigger. I was going to ask you if, if you, well, and I still will, if you've ever had to have the same kind of intervention on major issues to protect your place on the river that you did with your home. And clearly all of this tree cutting is a major intervention that you've done to keep your connection to the river. Right. Have there been other things while you've been there? Um, no, we've, we've uh, um, used our designation as a uh, historic landmark to uh, restore some buildings and utilize the uh, historic preservation tax credits um, to help with the economics of it. So we, <clears throat> we restored a, uh, a brick bank barn <clears throat> that was probably built in the early 19th century, um, probably by John Brokenborough, who was the second husband of uh, Thomas Mann Randolph's widow. <clears throat> he also uh, built as his townhouse the White House of the Confederacy. Mm. And that was <clears throat> being pushed in by the hill and would probably be a pile of rubble today if it weren't for the, the uh, Tax Act and the rehab that we did in 1984. <clears throat> and then we restored a, um, uh, an old stable, we call it. it. It's been through perhaps several transitions, perhaps starting as uh, even a forge. And then after the Civil War, the central chimney was knocked down and it was turned into a stable. And uh, we, that's a, been restored for our little meeting hall so we don't have to have all of the events in the main house. Of course, we do a lot of events under tents on the lawn as well. And then most recently, uh, <clears throat> a storehouse that we use to support our, our uh, events business uh, was riddled with hidden termite damage. And we had to rebuild um, basically two walls of that structure. How much of your event I know you do a lot of weddings. How much mm -hmm. of your <coughs> excuse me, event program and your general um, tourist visits, like the one I was there recently, how much of that is um, promoted by, the act, by, by being on the river, by having access to the river? Um, I, I think having that river view is, is important. Mm -hmm. um, so we are a, a river plantation. I think people uh, like the uh, the history. They like the serenity. Um, uh, you know, you go down a a mile long dirt lane to get <coughs> to uh, the house, and a short walk to the view of the river. And it does help to uh, I think keep away the bugs in the summer, and and oh. provides a, a a cool breeze with the prevailing southwesterly breezes that we have in the summertime. I think they do get uh, cooled by the river. And a lot of times, it's funny, um, storms will be coming down the river valley <coughs> and often they'll split and go over uh, southern Chesterfield or Hanover and, uh, and we miss the worst of it so our brides can have their ceremony outside under a uh, in the grove of trees where the wedding arbor is. Is that on your brochure to advertise your <laughs> <That's> weddings? <right. laughs> our, our natural tent <laughs> provided by the cooling breezes of the river. <laughs> so what would you, um, some, well, I'm going to ask you one more question but, to make sure I get it. What okay. was the year that the cows got swept away? Um, that was uh, <clears throat> 19, I think that, that Camille was 69. 
Uh, August um, of 69. And how would you sum up your experience, your feelings, your experience with the James River, living where you do? How would you sum that up? Well, having the, having the view is, uh, it is a, a distant water view, but it's, it's scenic and, and despite the development over in um, Chesterfield County and even right across the river with uh, James River High School, because of the uh, vegetation, the, you know, the, the nice trees and the, and the topography over there, most of it is hidden most of the time. So that's, uh, that you know, preserves our feeling of a, an, an island of tranquility in the, in, you know, and you feel like you're back in the 18th or 19th century. And speaking of, um, of chill, I was going to tell you the story about uh, <clears throat> the extreme cold we had in, the, in December of 1989 when uh, the river froze solid and uh, <clears throat> we went down to uh, our, our boat landing and, and actually walked across to the Powhatan side. The, and it looked like a, uh, a plate glass shot gone amuck because he's, I guess the way the, the water would move as it was freezing, it would pop up big plates of ice that looked like uh, plate glass, so you had to kind of maneuver around these uh, eruptions of of uh, ice to get to the other side. But it was absolutely solid. But that was a beautiful closing statement. An island of tranquility, and it feels like you're back in the 18th or 19th century. <laughs> Um, is there anything else you'd like to tell us and get on tape before we conclude? Well, we're the other you know accomplishment that I'm very proud of, besides uh, keeping it all going uh, for these forty years, um, is the fact that we have placed all of the open space. Uh, between River Road and the James River in conservation easement <clears throat> so that uh, it'll, it'll have to all, so that we preserve the, the setting for this uh, grand house and, um, and, the, and the plantation street. And I probably should mention that uh, one of the other ways that we add to the, of course, we add to the community by having, um, for instance, we've had the Collegiate Alumni Oyster Roast for, I think, 34 years now. Um, it, weddings are wonderful events and wonderful occasions in people's lives, and I feel like it's a special thing that we can be part of that, and in their way, they're appreciating history. Um, and we also uh, have had movie shoots, and that's a direct way that we add to the economy. Um, not this year. Well, we've got a, a episode that's going to air, thanks to the Smithsonian, about Dahlgren's Raid, which was an interesting um, event that happened uh, at near the end of the Civil War. And the river played a major role in that as well, in fact, because uh, <clears throat> Dahlgren was hoping to cross the river just west of Tuckahoe, and the, uh, the slave uh, guide who he thought was his friend, and he really was telling the truth, showed him where to cross the river, but because of the uh, wet weather, the river was up a few feet, and it washed one of his troopers uh, off his horse, so he thought uh, that he was lying to him, so he hanged him, and that was why uh, a major reason why his uh, attack on Richmond failed so miserably. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But uh, also, um, it, living there uh, has given us the opportunity to meet some wonderful people like Dumas Malone, the biographer of Thomas Jefferson, his uh, multi-volume set. One of my special friends, uh, 
Ed Chapel, longtime um, architectural historian at Colonial Williamsburg, and we've had great support from them as well as, of course, the uh, D Department of Historic Resources after our bad start uh, at the end of the 60s. Um, <clears throat> and funny enough, that the first movie ever, and I don't, I don't know what, my, what they paid my grandmother, maybe they paid to paint the house and some, some things, was uh, the introductory movie at Colonial Williamsburg that shows every 20 minutes in the information center and on closed TV in your room, I suppose, called The Story of a Patriot, starring Jack Lord of Hawaii, 5 fame. <clears throat> and they, uh, and Tuckahoe played uh, Riverton, the home of the Fries of Goochland County. And the only thing they got right about that was that it, we are in Goochland County. And uh, maybe that's a good place to end. <laughs> that was fabulous. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs>